Are we uh, ready to go, Kathy? No, I think I think the uh, mic is working. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, yeah. It now it's now you can hear me. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, all right. Well, shall we begin? Welcome. Um, I uh, let's see. I have an announcement that um, has been placed before me. That um, is. Um, not in the bulletin, and it's a get-together on Thursday, August the 3rd. That would be this Thursday, correct? At 11.15 at the Wine Vinegar, uh, is that say company in series, followed by lunch. See email previously sent or talk to Donna. And the, you, the ladies' retreat? Okay, so the ladies' retreat is up and coming on Saturday, October the 14th in Pleasanton, and there will be, there is, an, there is an email out there regarding it already. It seems to me like uh, there's been information about it out there for a while. Okay, so an email coming, link, link for the, uh, the registration, I believe. Uh, John Wise is the, um, the speaker, and he is our pastor in uh, Battle Mountain. Uh, Okay, and I forget the subject, wisdom, I think, something like that. Okay. All right, and then with regard to things going on here, our midweek is going to be the Millennium by R.C. Sproul, and that's in the series uh, Foundations. Uh, that's always a provocative subject. I think uh, you will enjoy that. Um, and we'll also, of course, be spending time in prayer. I should mention that one subject went by where only just a couple of us were able to watch it. It was probably one of the most important videos in the series. <laughs> so when we get through the foundation series, I'm going to circle back and, and do that one again. It was on the kingdom of, of God. All right, and then this evening, I thought we would do one more video that's uh, a little more technical than the one we saw last week. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. The one we saw last week was pretty heady, but uh, it's because it's such an unfamiliar subject, and I hope we didn't miss the point because really it's just the main point we wanted to get. What he was trying to show us was that radiometric dating methods are inconclusive. You can't trust them. You, you, can't, you can't really base any of your conclusions on them, okay? The, yes, I'm not going to go through all the arguments, but he also said that there are also chronometers in, in the world, thing, other ways we can date the, uh, the age of the earth, and those dating methods actually give us a date of less than 10,000 years. So what we're going to look at this evening is, is really um, another Ken Ham, so it'll be easy to, to follow and probably entertaining as well, where he's going to remind us that we can't start with the way man thinks, okay? What he's going to deal with this evening really is, is presuppositionalism. And the simple point is, is this, that everybody's looking at the same set of facts. And, and that's something they've been stressing in these videos. We're all looking at the same facts, the same fossils and the same rocks. We're looking at the same radio, you know, radioactive decay. And, and things like this, but we're, we're coming away with different conclusions. And the question is, why are we coming away with different conclusions? And it's because of our presuppositions. It's because of our basic belief system and what it is we, we have to get from those, those facts. Well, so Ken Ham is going to talk about, well, if you start with man's wisdom and man's word, this is where you're going to end up. And if you start with God's wisdom and God's word, you know, this is where you're going to end up. So he's kind of bring it all together, everything we've seen so far. And again, the reason why we're watching this uh, series is simply to, again, show us how we can trust what the Bible says. We're sort of uh, looking at objective reasons why we believe the Bible is the Word of God. There is the ultimate reason, which is God has opened our eyes to see His glory, to see that it is His Word, and to be able to receive that and receive it with conviction. But to demonstrate it to somebody who, who doesn't have that belief, uh, that conviction, that's really what we're, we're trying to do. 
And uh, one thing I, I'll mention probably this evening as well, if I can remember, but I, since I remember it right now, is that Ken Ham did say something that I don't agree with, and I don't think that uh, R.C. Sproul would agree with it. And what he said was, you, you, well, let's just say yes and no. Yes, I agree with it. No, I don't agree with it. You can't demonstrate to somebody that the Bible is the Word of God. You can't. R.C. would say you can't. And he would say you can do it with arguments that are absolutely conclusive. They're, they're reasonable arguments. As a matter of fact, it's the way we prove anything. And can do that with absolute certainty. But the, w the way where they both agree is that no one's going to actually receive the Bible as the Word of God unless their presuppositions change. And for that to happen, their heart has to change. And that has to be done sovereignly by the Lord. Okay, so... Anyway, that's the only thing I think wasn't terribly clear from what he was saying. It seemed to be, he seemed to be saying we really can't give any arguments. But really, what Answers in Genesis is doing is giving arguments through, through their whole presentation. The fossil record, the radiometric dating, the genetics, everything we've looked at are all arguments to prove that uh, what the Bible says actually is true. All right. Well, with that in mind... Um, what we're looking at this morning is a very important section of Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians, where Paul is going to contrast the results of following the Judaizers with the results of trusting Christ. Uh, how do we overcome our sins? How can we overcome them? Can we overcome them by keeping the law, by trying to perfect ourselves through our own obedience and our own strength? Or do we achieve that uh, through the gospel, by the power of the Holy Spirit that the Lord has given to us, by following the Spirit. So walking by the Spirit, that's what we're looking at this morning because that is key and we're going to want to understand exactly what Paul means by that. So let me give you the heart of our text in our meditation. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these uh, are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, I know that these two verses, if you think about them, almost seem to contradict each other. You know, Paul's saying, do this and you can obey. And then he goes on to say, you can't obey because you've got these two principles at war with each other, but um, actually that is not what he is saying. What he's doing is giving us the solution, the, the, uh, as it were, the key to victory of overcoming our flesh, and it is by walking in the Spirit. So we're going to want to understand what that means. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and let's, um, let's ask the Lord for His grace as we uh, prepare to worship Him. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with us now as we do the most important thing that we can do in this world, which is to worship you and to worship your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to worship the Holy Spirit, and to do so in the power of the Spirit. Lord, be with us now as we seek your grace and your mercy to do these things. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you are able to, would you please stand with me as we are called to worship through Psalm 119, the first eight verses. And, uh, you know, I, I know that um, just from my college experience that there are those who would view the Old Testament writers as being legalistic, as looking to the law for their salvation and their, and their justification. But we need to see that that's not what they're doing. Uh, they understand that the only way that they can walk in 
the ways of the Lord is by His grace, by trusting in that promised seed, in that um, seed of Abraham through whom the nations would be blessed. And depending, of course, upon uh, the time in, in history, uh, the son of David who would um, uh, be the, the righteous king who would deliver them. But the psalmist writes this, and again, remember that we can only do this if we walk in the Spirit. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies, who seek Him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in His ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray again uh, for your grace and mercy as we worship you. And even, Lord, as we need your spirit to do anything spiritually pleasing to you, we need his affection, the love that he produces in our hearts. We need that to obey you as we uh, obey the commandments, but specifically as we would obey the, the second commandment, the first and second, in worshiping you. And, and uh, Lord, actually all four, the first four, uh, as we call upon your name, we would not do so in vain as we worship you on your holy day. We pray, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us grace, fill us with love that we may love you and praise you and worship you. And we'll thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's remain standing and let's sing as we begin hymn number 330, Holy Ghost, Dispel our sadness. And again, this is a prayer to the Spirit that He would come and minister in our hearts and fill us with the joy the Lord desires us to have in our relationship with Him.
All right. Uh, I'd like to read um, uh, for you a portion of um, Romans chapter 8. Uh, by the way, Kathy, if you're not aware of it, you can just push the mute button if you want to mute me. But I guess, I guess you need to keep the mic going for the stream, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Never mind. All right. Um, okay. So um, let's read the uh, opening verses of Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Which, in which Paul is giving to us the, uh, the resolution of the struggle that uh, is going on in, in his own heart uh, in Romans chapter 7. And again, Romans 7 is a very difficult passage to kind of unravel uh, as far as what Paul is referring to when he's talking about the struggle. But um, I can't say with absolute certainty. There are some things in the Bible that you can't say, well, I'm absolutely certain this is the case. Uh, thankfully, there aren't a lot of those, okay, but this may be one of them. Was Paul referring to himself as a believer, as an unbeliever, as an awakened unbeliever? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell, but um, anyway, I do think, you know, I think the, per my, the percentage of my conviction falls in the area of his speaking as a believer, and he is talking about the struggle that's going on in, in his life uh, because of these two principles. And I often look at uh, uh, Galatians 5.17, which we read just a little bit earlier, where he describes that same struggle, which only goes on in the life of a believer, not an unbeliever. An unbeliever doesn't have a struggle because um, he has just one principle, one desire, and that is for sin. Now, he may struggle uh, with his reputation or how the sin affects him, and he may try to hide it. and. Maybe he's ashamed of it and all these various things, but there's no love for God in his heart that makes him fight against that desire of the flesh. Okay, so having said that, this is the resolution that Paul gives to us for that struggle, and it's the same resolution that he gives to us in our text this morning. So again, we're looking at this from a slightly different angle, and hopefully it makes sense. So this is what Paul says. I just want to read the first four verses of uh, Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh." so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I do think there's two things going on in, this, in these few verses. I think Paul is talking about you know, what we call imputation, the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. But he's also talking about sanctification. And that's the thing we're really wanting to look at, uh, you know, in our text this morning, because where there is genuine justification, trust in Christ, there will be sanctification, and that means there will be the breaking of this power, this reign of sin in our lives, giving us the, the freedom to obey. So even though we're going through the struggle, we're not going to be condemned, because if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been set free from the law, we've died to the law to be justified or condemned by it, and we have been united with Christ. We died with Him on the cross, we've been raised with Him to newness of life. So we are just in Him. That's where the no non uh, condemnation comes from. But there's the other issue of how we live, because we came into this world in bondage to sin, Sin was all we wanted. It was our master, and, and we obeyed it. Paul says that Christ has taken care of that issue as well. He has given to us a new principle, the law of the Spirit of life, which is that new desire the Spirit of God gives to us. And when he says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, he's not talking about imputation there. He's not saying so that you might be righteous in Christ. But he's saying that, that God has... Uh, given us the Holy Spirit through the work of His Son in order that, that we might be transformed into His image, that we might actually begin to live according to that law, that what the law requires might be being fulfilled in our lives. I hope you see that you know, the, 
the difference there or what, what the point of it is. It's really the guarantee that we can grow in grace, but it comes through that law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus who was given to us. We could not obey the law of God in our flesh. That's what he says in verse 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Through his work, he frees us from condemnation. Through his work, he breaks the power of sin. He gives us the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit leads us in the ways of the Lord. And if we just understand what it means to follow him, to walk by him, we can have victory over sin. We can grow in our grace. That, that you know, battle, that struggle between the two principles, the flesh and the spirit, is broken. And we can follow the spirit and walk according to the law of God without being legalists, right? Because we're not walking that way. We're not living that way in order to justify ourselves. Rather, we're living that way because we want to live that way, because we want to love in the way God calls us uh, to love. All right, well, let's, uh, let's respond to that by uh, singing a hymn that um, we're familiar with, but not in our hymnals. It's called a triune prayer. And it reminds us of uh, our need of the work of our God to um, work this sanctification in us. Uh, again, this is His work in us, although we do have a part in it when it comes to sanctification. You know, we must put sin to death. We must put it off. We must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must yield to the Spirit and nurture that love of the Spirit in our hearts. So let, let's uh, use this, um, this hymn as, as a prayer to uh, help us pursue that. All right, well, let's come to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask this morning for your grace as we would focus on this particular truth in your word because it's so very important as we're reminded of the purpose of our redemption is certainly that we be free from guilt, that, that we be made your children adopted into your family. Uh, we spend eternity with you. All those things are so very glorious, and we do look forward to that. But Father, we pray that we also may see our purpose here on earth and, and what it is you have saved us to be, uh, what you want us, Lord, to do. 
and that is to show forth your glory, to become like Jesus as Christians, meaning little Christ. Uh, we think like Him, behave like Him, speak like Him, uh, are being transformed into His image. And as we are, we shine as lights in this world, uh, drawing attention to our Heavenly Father. And as R.C. Sproul reminded us a few weeks ago uh, with regard to the kingdom of heaven, drawing attention to the King, the one who reigns over the earth and the one to whom all men should bow the knee and that they should worship and serve. But Lord, that, that comes about uh, by people understanding who you are, understanding the gospel and seeing something of your glory and through the gospel beginning to give glory and praise and honor to you so that they desire to submit to Christ and to obey him. So Lord, we pray, would you fill us again with your Holy Spirit? Would you transform us into the image of Christ as we walk and as we yield, by, uh, well, yield to the Spirit's uh, uh, leading in our life as he leads us in the word of God? We pray again that we may nurture, Lord, that love in our hearts for you and that we would make Jesus known to others so that others would come to know you. We pray this, Father, for us, for all your church. We pray this, Lord, for your missionaries who serve you in foreign lands. We pray you would bless their work, and we pray the kingdom of heaven would continue to grow, grow in power, grow in extent grow in its influence, and that more and more people would bow the knee so that that petition that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray would come to pass, that your will, your commandments would be obeyed on earth, even as they are, are obeyed in heaven. And Lord, as we pray for these things, we also ask specifically for, Lord, the children that you have given to us, your children, we ask that you would extend your mercies to them, to those, Father, who um, may have even professed faith at one time in Christ, said they loved him and were trusting him, and now have embraced the world and are living worldly lives uh, and have completely repudiated the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask, have mercy upon them, have mercy, we pray, upon many of our family members, our friends, our loved ones. Lord, have mercy on many throughout the world. Bring your people, bring your elect to faith in Christ. Gather your sheep, we pray, through the gospel. Bring the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we, we ask that uh, it would continue in its powerful influence to leaven, as it were, the world until the entire world is leavened, until the knowledge of the Lord covers the land as the waters cover the seas. Thank you, Lord, again for your grace and mercy in us that we can be in the kingdom of heaven and that we can be a part of this glorious work. Lord, grant to us that we would enjoy it and take joy in it even when we suffer for it. And our Father will praise you and bless you. And Lord, this morning we would also want to bring before you, of course, our, our brethren who are in, in need. Uh, we lift up to you our brother Jack, who is in uh, doctor's hospital, uh, has been there now for um, three weeks and uh, is going to be there apparently for a, a little while longer. As he waits upon you, Lord, for the physicians to operate, which now I understand is uh, not going to take place until we reach, um, I think it was eight weeks from onset. So there are still several weeks, and then there's going to be recovery. Father, we pray, preserve his life. We pray that you would grant continued strength to him as he has to endure this, this pain. We pray, give the doctors wisdom, continued wisdom and skill in treating him. And Father, do raise him up again to health. Do strengthen Gail, strengthen the family members. Lord, use this as an opportunity to draw those family members that, that don't know you to, to faith in, in Christ. And Lord, we'll, we'll praise you and thank you for that. 
Lord, we continue to lift Cindy up to you and Mark as they wait upon you for the upcoming surgery uh, on um, her colon condition. And we pray again for skill and wisdom, and we pray you would deliver her from this affliction. We pray, Father, for Shirley and Rod as, as they're going through, again, very similar situation. Uh, we, we thank you that Shirley's here. We thank you that she's doing so much better. We pray continue, Lord, to give her a daily measure of health and strength. And if you're willing, that the cancer would go into remission. And Father, strengthen those who are giving care and encouragement to them. Strengthen all of us to be an encouragement to them. Father, again, we, we praise you and thank you. Would you see all the needs in the congregation? all of our weaknesses, all of our afflictions. And Lord, would you have mercy upon us to strengthen us. Father, we ask your grace and your forgiveness that you would please be with us. Um, grant to us that we, experiencing your mercy and grace, would be those who would be able to show the same mercy and grace to others. Uh, as we're going to be reminded in our text this morning that um, uh, hating somebody is not an option for us. We cannot be bitter, and we do need to be gracious and merciful and forgiving. Grant, Lord, that we would be. And Father, we, again we pray as we consider our text this morning, uh, help us to overcome our sins. Show us how we can do that that we're not automatically delivered when we come to faith in Christ. There is work that we must do uh, in order to uh, gain victory, as it were, over our uh, flesh. Uh, show us, Lord, how to do that, and Lord, we will praise you for that. And Lord, I also would just pray, as, um, just as you've reminded me, to uh, uh, pray for um, uh, Laura's grandmother, as she's waiting upon you to take her out of this world into the next, we pray, grant her peace, grant her comfort, grant that she would be ready, Lord, be preparing her through these days, and prepare the family also uh, for the absence of this loved one. But Lord, let uh, what they experience when that time comes uh, be what, what it should be from your word, because we know that she goes to a place that is so much better than here that really, if we're going to weep, we should weep for ourselves. But also, Lord, that we can look forward to seeing her again as she uh, is in such joy, happiness in this world of love. Lord, may we all look forward to the day we enter into it. We pray too, Lord, in the time between now and then, that we may experience as much of heaven as we possibly can while we're here on earth. Lord, show us how we might, and we'll praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, this morning, as I've already told you, we're looking at Galatians. We're actually going to finish chapter 5. Galatians 5, 13 through 26, because I do think Paul is really just dealing with one topic here, so I, I thought we would be able to uh, deal with all of this in, in one setting. But let me read the text, and again, remember the, the thrust of it, the point of it, is that we need to walk by the Spirit to overcome our sins, okay, to overcome the desires of the flesh. So Paul says this, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, 
enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who be, belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Well, may the Lord bless this portion of his word to our understanding, to our edification, to our growth in grace. Now, remember last week, Paul reminded us that since Christ has set us free, remember, free from the law, free from our obedience for righteousness, for our justification, okay, we're no longer married to the law to be justified or condemned by it, but married to Christ, okay? We must jealously guard that freedom by not turning back to the law, which is what the Judaizers were trying to get the Galatians to do. If we do, Paul says, we again become slaves to a system that can't save us. Now, again, this is what we saw last week. It can't save us because we can't do what the law requires, Remember what the law requires is absolute, perfect, and perpetual, continual obedience from the time we come into this world to the time we leave. But obviously we can't do that. No one can since Adam and we come into this world already guilty. He also said to turn to the law would be to turn away from God's grace, His free gift of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. If we turn to the law away from Christ, that means that we also turn away from everything Christ has to offer, all of His gracious benefits. Paul says we can only inherit God's kingdom by faith, okay? We have to trust in Christ. We need this righteousness, His righteousness. But he also defined the kind of faith that actually does trust in Christ. He says it is a faith that works by love. And we saw what he meant by that is that this love shares the Spirit's nature. He was not called the Holy Spirit for nothing. The Spirit of God is the one who desires holiness, perfect holiness. And the love that he gives desires the same thing. He gives us, by uniting himself to our souls, the desire for everything that is holy and good and righteous. That is why we originally reached out to the Lord Jesus Christ in love because the Spirit changed our disposition towards Him and we received Him as our Savior and our Lord. That's the reason why we love the Father, why we love the worship of God, why we love His people. And it's also why we will obey the law, you know, why we will want to do good things because of the Spirit working in us. It's really the same thing that Paul was writing about when he says to Titus in Titus 2, 13 through 14, that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Where does that zeal come from? Okay, it comes from the affection of the Holy Spirit for those things because we only do what we want to do. That's just the way we work. You know, the will, we exercise our will in the direction that our heart is inclined. So God changes our hearts and inclines us in the right direction, and that's the direction that we will go. Now, this morning, Paul goes on to remind us of something else we also know very well through our own experience, and that is that this new affection, this new nature, this New inclination towards holiness is not the only desire that's inside of our hearts. We still have what is left over of the old man. We still have corruption. We still have sin. And that is what makes it difficult for us to do 
the things that we want to do. I don't have to tell you that. I think we all know that that's the case. But Paul here is going to tell us how we can overcome it. He's not going to say it's easy, okay? But it's possible. It's possible because of the spirit that our Lord has given to us. Now, Paul has already told us that we lose our freedom when we submit to the law for our justification, that we become slaves to the law. But he also warns us in this opening verse that we'll lose our freedom if we use God's grace as an excuse to sin, okay, we become the slaves of our flesh. Now, this, this is what he's addressing throughout this text. How can we avoid this? Okay, he writes in verse 13, first of all, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I don't think Paul here is departing from what he's addressing with regarding to the Judaizers. I think what he's saying here is, if you turn to the direction the Judaizers are pointing you, you will be turning, basically turning God's grace into an opportunity again for your flesh to exert itself, okay? And we're going to see more about that. But Paul also writes in Romans 6.15, he asks this question, shall we sin? because we are not under law, but under grace? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no. And he puts it in the strongest possible way. May it never be. But sadly, you see, that is how many people, many professing Christians, okay, respond to God's grace. They begin to think along these lines. If I don't have to obey the law to make it to heaven, if Christ has done it all, and he gives it to me as a free gift by faith. Then the conclusion is, it doesn't really matter how I live because I'm going to get there either way. I can either obey him or not obey him if it is Christ's righteousness that actually gets me into heaven. Now, I think you know there's a lot of people who believe that. John Gerstner, being aware of this, characterized what he would consider to be their theme song with this somewhat humorous, although it's not humorous, Verse, free from the law, O oh, blessed condition, I can sin as I please and still have remission. Well, that is absolutely not true, okay? God's grace is never an excuse for sin. But there, as I've said, there are so many who believe that this is the case. The college that Don and I attended, they actually taught that, okay? You don't have to obey the Lord in order to be saved. Um, neither meritoriously or even after you're saved, you can still be an enemy of God and still go to heaven. But the problem for us is sometimes we're tempted to think along these same lines. You know, our flesh will say, well, you know, Christ obeyed, and if I give in at this point, I give in at that point, I practice this, that thing which I know is wrong, it's going to be okay. Well, we need to remember something, though, when we think this way what Paul has already shown us, and it's this, that where we really are trusting in Jesus Christ, truly trusting Him, and we are justified, that there will be true sanctification. And that sanctification, that growth into holiness, that growth into the likeness of Christ is going to be across the board. It's going to be in every area. There's not going to be any area where we're not fighting sin and seeking to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he told us last week why that will be the case. Because the faith that the Spirit of God gives us works by love. Love for what's right. Love for holiness. Now, if you love holiness, you can't practice sin. You know, you might fall into sin for a time. I mean, we all stumble and fall from time to time, but his point is you will not live in it. God did not free us from the law to give us, as it were, the freedom to break the law, but he freed us so that we could obey the law. That, that is the goal of redemption in this life, that we might become like Jesus, who was the perfectly obedient Son of God. So, rather than using our freedom to sin, Paul says we need to use it to love. 
verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he also writes in Romans, which we know is very parallel to what he writes in Galatians, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay, again, drawing that connection between obedience to the law and love. God has freed us to obey, and what it means is He has freed us to love, to love in the way He calls us to love. Now here, He is referring to the second greatest commandment, what the law requires of us toward our neighbor. But the same thing applies to the greatest commandment. We will also love God, and we will put Him first. Now, think about this. The Judaizers, what they were teaching, did not produce this kind of love. Paul writes in verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Now, how did the Galatians fall into that, that particular struggle where they are contentious now and, and fighting? Well, remember, the Judaizers taught that we need the law for righteousness. So if you, as Paul already said, if you turn away from the law, excuse me, turn to the law, turn away from Christ, okay, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to grieve the Spirit of God, the Spirit that He's given to you, the Spirit that works by love. Now, remember, Paul is assuming through this, this whole letter that the Galatians, that they're not, that they're not apostates. He, he sees them as in danger of apostatizing, and he's trying to get them not to do so through argumentation by giving them the truth and, of course, praying for them. But he sees them as believers. He believes the Spirit of God is, is in them. So what he's saying is, as you were turning away from Christ and you're turning to the law, you're grieving the Spirit of God because now you're, you're disobeying the gospel. But when you grieve the Spirit, His work, His influence is quenched, which means it's diminished, it, it lessens. And the more the Spirit of God's influence lessens, the stronger then your flesh becomes. Now, in this state, the Galatians immediately began to try to outdo each other in their righteous works. That's what a works righteousness does. Think about Paul. What was his boast when he was a Pharisee? According to, you know, the second chapter, or the third chapter of, of Philippians, he was, he was saying, you know, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm, I've done everything right. I, I was perfect. You know, that's the way that Pharisees think. That's the way that people who are trying to earn their own righteousness think. They're, they're trying to become good and, and better, and as they are, they compare themselves with each other, and they get into conflict. This competition, one commentator writes, led to, to conceit, to conflict, and to envy. It didn't have the results that they had hoped for, which is to fulfill the law of God, which is love, but it produced just the opposite effect. It actually strengthened their flesh. Okay? And that's why Paul writes in verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Paul's not just suddenly dealing with a new topic uh, out of thin air. He's relating this to what's going on with the Judaizers. If you turn to the law, you're strengthening your flesh and you're weakening the work of the Holy Spirit and you're not gonna be able to do what you please. Now, the same thing happens to us when we try to grow in our likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ, but we try to do it in our own strength. The harder we try, the less like Him we're actually going to become if we are doing it in our own strength. Paul tells us next there's really only one way we can move forward in our sanctification, in our growth into the image of Christ, and that comes in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, notice that I read these two verses in reverse order, because if we don't understand the relationship between them, as I said at the opening, it looks like Paul's contradicting himself. I mean, he says in verse 16, walk by the Spirit, 
and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. If you walk by the Spirit, you will obey God. Okay? But then he goes on to say in verse 17 that because of the conflict between the flesh and the Spirit, we can't actually obey the Lord or maybe obey Him perhaps in the way we would like to obey Him. Well, we need to see that verse 17 is the reason Paul gives, and he actually does use the word for, which means because, right? is the reason why we need to listen to verse 16. Why should we listen to verse 16 that says, walk by the Spirit? You will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Because of the struggle that he talks about in verse 17. There's a struggle between these two desires, between these two natures. The flesh keeps getting in our way, and it is preventing us from obeying Christ. So Paul tells us in verse 16, if we walk by the Spirit... We won't obey the flesh. Isn't that wonderful news? I mean, isn't that what we all want to hear? How do you stop from sinning? Walk by the Spirit. And by the way, he says this in the strongest possible way. In, in the original language, you can translate it this way. Walk by the Spirit, and you shall by no means carry out the desires of the flesh. That sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? And that sounds also encouraging, right? It's possible to overcome our sins, right? So what the law can't do, again, think Judaizers, their way of doing things. The Spirit can. Think gospel, okay? Christ has given us His Spirit to give us the ability to do what our flesh cannot do, to obey the commandments of God. But to do that, we have to walk by the Spirit. So we have to ask the question, what does that mean? Well, it means, and again, knowing this doesn't resolve all the issues. There's still a battle ahead of us. But it means we need to yield to the desires the Spirit of God creates in our souls for righteousness. Okay? Remember, there's two principles the flesh that is constantly drawing us toward the world and toward sin, and the flesh, or excuse me, the spirit who is drawing us toward the things of God, you know, toward what is holy and what is good. Whenever we are faced with any choice, and it doesn't, doesn't matter what the, that choice is, these two desires will be working in our hearts to move us one way or the other. And Paul is telling us that we need to make a choice. Okay, we need to choose which one we're going to yield to. So here's a few examples. Am I going to read the Bible today and pray, or am I not? Okay, now why do you think there's a struggle in that area? Okay, it's because there's two principles at work. Am I going to go to worship today on the Lord's Day, or am I going to stay home? Well, again, there's a struggle. There's a very real struggle we face every single Lord's Day. Am I going to use this opportunity God has given me to witness to this individual, or am I going to let it pass? Okay. The reason the struggle is because of these two principles, and the same thing is true really in every area of life, even the most mundane things. Am I going to eat what I know is good for me, or am I going to eat what I know isn't? Okay. Well, where do you think, again, the, the struggle comes from? Well, this struggle is at every level. The flesh is always going to try to lead us to dishonor God and to offend Him. The Spirit always to glorify Him. Okay? So we need to follow. We need to give in to. We need to yield to the Spirit, uh, His desire. And, and we know the difference. I mean, how do you know the difference between what the Spirit wants and what the flesh wants? Read the Bible. Okay? because he tells us in the Bible, and he's going to tell us actually here in just a moment. Now, another question we need to ask is this, how can we do that more consistently, walk by the Spirit, yield to the Spirit, go the direction the Spirit is calling us to go? Well, first of all, we need to understand a principle I've already mentioned before, something that Jonathan Edwards said. He said, we will always choose according to our strongest inclination at any given time, right? There's something is set before you. You have inclinations for it. You have inclinations against it. Which are you going to choose? Well, if they're equal, you know, then you, you maybe have to, well, 
you know, you, you may struggle, right? But if one is decidedly stronger than the other, we know that we go with that stronger desire. So if we want to yield to the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, choose the things that honor God, we need a stronger desire for those things. So now the question becomes, how do we strengthen that desire? Now again, you know the answer to that. We can only do it by nurturing the love that He has given to us through the Holy Spirit, through the means of grace. Okay, the ways in which the Spirit of God works in our hearts is through the Word and prayer and worship and the sacraments, fellowship. All these things that our flesh is trying to keep us away from are the things that will strengthen the Spirit and weaken the flesh. That's why the flesh has a mind of its own. And it doesn't want us to grow and walk in the Spirit. It wants us to dishonor God. It is an, in, in, well, let's just say it's an internal enemy that is constantly fighting against us. That's why our desire for the things of the Lord need to be stronger. So if we want those affections to grow so that we can more easily choose the stronger of those, okay, we need to spend more time with the Lord. You know, think personal devotions. Think worship. Think gathering with God's people. And think practicing the presence, if I can use that term. You know, there was a Brother Lawrence and there's some question about him, but wrote a book, Practicing the Presence of God, and he just simply said, you know, as we walk through the day, remember God is with you. He sees what you're doing. Jonathan Edwards would say the same thing. Remember that all-seeing eye that knows not only what's going on in your life right now, but also what's in your mind and what's in your heart. You know, be aware that He is watching you. Well, that should be an encouragement because if He is with you and sees you, that also means you can have communion with Him throughout the day, and we should be, and thinking that the one I love the most is with me and sees me. I, I need to make choices that honor Him. You know, it has been said that whenever we commit a sin, it, it's as plain to God as, as though we, we actually ascended into heaven and committed it before His throne. If you, you know, think in those terms, if we think in those terms, it might make us not, you know, give in to sin the next time. But it is true that he sees. So we need to make sure, not, not just for fear of punishment or, or, or uh, discipline, but because we love him, okay? He's with us. We need to make choices that honor him. So spend more time with him. Act on the love that you already have or that we already have for him. We need to act on that. Do what we know he calls us to do. And we need to fight against temptation and work hard at putting our sins to death. It's not just strengthening the influence of the Spirit, it's also weakening the flesh. And we do that when we, well, as Paul says, put it to death. You know, kill those desires. Uh, see them as they really are. Uh, learn to hate them. Learn to weaken them by staying away from the things that feed them, okay? Um, and not giving in to them. <laughs> because when you give in to them, that gives them a great deal of strength. Now, Paul says that, that if we do these things, um, of course, we'll obey the law, but there are also some other benefits. Uh, you know, we will love, but we'll also strengthen our assurance that we belong to Him. He says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And I think in the context, what he means by this is what we've been looking at, okay? If you have the love of the Spirit in you, and you sense that because you are giving in to Him, yielding to Him, and doing what He calls you to do, that means that you're no longer under the law as a covenant of works to be justified or condemned. Uh, you are free, okay? If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So there is assurance. Now, so that there's no mistake as to what Paul means by the desires of the flesh, that we are to avoid and the things of the Spirit that we're to cultivate, he gives us a partial list. And I want us just to consider particularly the, the uh, deeds of the flesh briefly, okay? He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, okay? Refers to sexual immorality between married or unmarried people. If it's something God forbids, it's immoral. Impurity which is the opposite of, of purity. 
This is really a more general word for sexual immorality that includes our thoughts and our words as well as our actions. Sensuality, which is a complete lack of moral restraint, extreme immorality. I don't know if you see the progression here, you know, immorality, impurity, sensuality, and perhaps idolatry would lead to this because it can become an idol. But idolatry is the worship of false gods, idols. Anything we love more than God, anything we put before God becomes an idol to us. Sorcery, the use of magic, often involving drugs and the casting of spells. Enmities, that means being the enemy of someone else. There's somebody you hate and, and you are their enemy. Okay? You're not supposed to be their enemy. Strife. Conflict that results from competition. Well, that's something Paul's addressing. They're competing with each other. Who's going to be the best? And it particularly has to do with conflict that is expressed in words, so verbal arguments. Jealousy, a particularly strong feeling of resentment or envy. Outbursts of anger, and a state of intense anger, fury, wrath, rage. Disputes, resentfulness that's based on jealousy that apply or implies competition. Dissensions, dividing into opposing groups. Factions, dividing into groups that are loyal to certain schools of thought or practice. And none of this goes on in the church, right? Okay. These are works of the flesh. Okay. Envying, ill will towards somebody because of some real or perceived advantage. Drunkenness, being under the influence or control of a foreign substance, and of course in those days it was primarily alcohol, and maybe the same is true today. Carousing, drinking parties that involve unrestrained indulgence in alcohol and immoral behavior. Another word would be orgy, okay? Now Paul understands that this is not, is, isn't by any means an exhaustive list, right? So he says, he adds this, and things like these, okay? These are the works of the flesh. These are the things we, we need to put off, we need to avoid, we need to put to death. Why? Because Paul says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, okay? If we practice these things, we are not looking forward to heaven, we are looking forward to hell, okay? We're looking forward to the lake of fire. Now, is Paul saying here that if we ever fall into any of these sins, if we continue to struggle with these things, that we're doomed? Well, no, he's not saying that because if there's a struggle, okay, that, that's actually a good indicator, isn't it? It means that we're trying to, to stop doing it. But remember, it needs to be for the right reasons. We can't just struggle against it because it's going to cost my reputation or I'm, I'm going to be ashamed if this is exposed. Um, trying to keep up appearances. Uh, people who are unconverted can struggle with sin for that reason. But as um, uh, John Gerster said on one occasion when he was using this illustration, all an unconverted person can do is close one window, representing shutting off the, the smoke, let's say, that's in this house going out this window. That's your corruption flowing this direction. But you have to open another window. You, you can't just get rid of the smoke, you see, because your house is still filled with smoke, and so it has to go somewhere. You might cut off this sin, but you'll begin to channel it this direction. Uh, that can happen with unbelievers, but if you're struggling against those sins because you love the Lord and you love what is right, that is a good indicator. You have that struggle that Paul's referring to, and that only happens in the hearts of true believers, okay? What Paul is saying, though, is this, if we practice these things, if we give in to them without struggling, it, you know, we, we just do them and, and we don't worry about it. That means we don't have the Spirit, and it does mean we are doomed unless we turn to Jesus in faith for His righteousness, for His forgiveness. Now. That, those are the deeds of the flesh that we are to put off. What does Paul say that we should be looking for 
and we should cultivate in our lives. He says in verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go through and explain all these things. I just want to say this. Notice that love heads the list, okay? Faith, you know, the Spirit of God gives a faith that works by love. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of love. He gives us the ability to obey the commandments of God. Holiness and love are essentially the same things. This is the primary main fruit of the Spirit of God, love. And Jonathan Edwards, I was going to look for this quote. I couldn't find it, but um, if I find it, I'll have to bring it. But he shows how each of these fruits that follow is really just, there's just simply expressions of that same love that flows out in various circumstances, you know, um, that they all result into love. Love is the fountain, and these are the fruits, the fruits of love. Now, Paul says, again, such things, there is no law, and that the reason why there isn't is because this is what the law requires. <laughs> this is what God wants. This is why He gave us the Spirit. This is why He gave us the law in the first place to show us that this is love, this is right, and this is what we need to do. So there's not going to be any law against doing what God actually commands us to do. And so Paul says, um, these are the things we need to be cultivating and... If these things are in us and they are increasing, it also strengthens our usefulness. I think, I think you can see that, right? The more you love, the more useful you're going to be. But also our assurance. Now, Paul concludes this section with a summary statement. Verse 24, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Remember what Paul says in Romans 6? That if we are trusting in Christ, we were crucified with Him. Okay, when He died on the cross, our body of sin died on the cross with Him, and we were buried when He was buried. The old man has been done away with, although we understand that he's still very much alive. That's the flesh, gets in our way. But he is in principle crucified. He's been put to death. And when Christ was raised, we were raised with Him in order to live for God. Uh, you know, as new creatures made alive by the Holy Spirit, we are now to follow Him. Remember what Paul says in Romans 6, we are to see ourselves as those who were, who were dead. We are in the tomb with Christ, but when He was raised, we were raised with Him to live a new kind of life, no longer as the slaves of sin, but now as the slaves of righteousness that we are to yield ourselves uh, as instruments of righteousness. So that's what Paul means when he says, as new creatures who have been made alive by the Spirit, we are now to follow Him. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, if, if we have the life of the Spirit in us, if He is our life, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's follow Him. If we do... We will put our sins to death, he concludes in verse 26, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to apply the things that we've uh, just heard. Remember them and, and apply them. Well, let's, let's take just a few moments and um, let's bow in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us do this. And as we do this, to also prepare us to come to the, uh, the table this morning.